everyone. Can go ahead and hit go. Um, welcome back. It's nice to be uh, back here together. It feels like we never left. Um, we are going to get off and running on several different uh, topics this first week of the session um, that will hopefully lay some groundwork to help us with bills that we are going to work on in the coming weeks. Um, I thought it would be helpful to do a review of this bill that we voted out of committee in April since it has been a number of months since we looked in any depth at the uh, at the, the details of S54. It is my um, understanding that S54 is, um, is on track to come to the floor of the House um, in the beginning of February. It has a few other policy committees to, uh, to spend some time in so that they can be sure they've taken testimony from their um, perspectives on, uh, on what a, a retail cannabis industry would look like in Vermont. And then, of course, it um, needs to make its way through the money committees. Um, so the bill resides right now in Ways and Means. And um, there's a couple of different paths that it could take at this point if there was a need on the part of one of the other policy committees to suggest a change. We might, uh, we might weigh in on an amendment that the Ways and Means Committee could add to the bill, or we could request that the bill come back to our committee to do that work. Um, so that remains to be seen, but, um, but I expect that uh, we'll be trying to move this bill uh, within the next six weeks uh, through the floor of the House. Um, I wanted to refresh all of our memories on the details of the bill because when it becomes more real that it's coming to the floor of the House, then your colleagues will begin to ask questions. And what I've noticed from having conversations with members about it is um, there's a lot of detail and there's a lot of subtlety to the direction that we took on this bill that's important for us to be able to communicate to our colleagues who have not been as immersed in this as we have. <laughs> Um, in order to uh, in order to help the House understand uh, whether members would like to vote for the bill or not. So I wanted to give us this time here with Michelle today. I think we have about an hour on the agenda and, um, and an opportunity to jog through the bill and, um, and ask questions. So thank you, Michelle, for joining us. Thanks. For the record, Michelle Child, Office <coughs> of the Legislative Council. And um, you should have on your iPads uh, three documents from me, uh, one being the, the committee amendment that you passed out in April. Another one are highlights for the amendment, and then also the timeline. Um, so, and the timeline hasn't changed from what you had before. The only new document is this summary, and I thought if it works for you that I would just kind of go through the mm -hmm. summary rather than going through mm -hmm. the bill mm -hmm. and then and then if you want to if somebody has questions and we want to go back and look at specific language in the bill then I can direct you there and we can take a look so this one um, this is just kind of organized because it's a big bill and so many people have questions about the bill what's in it opt-in opt-out taxes things like that um, in the fall, working with uh, the chair, I kind of put together some summary materials that you guys can use either with constituents or other folks um, to kind of hone down on some of these issues. Um, so starting out is just with the regulatory agency. You guys are really familiar with this part because you spent a lot of time discussing it and you landed on having five members of the Cannabis Control Board, um, each with the different appointing authorities. Um, the chair and the member of the board are all full-time state employees. Um, the chair's compensation is equal to uh, two-thirds of a superior court judge, and the other members is equal to one-half of a superior court judge. The board hires an executive director who has to be an attorney who has uh, regulatory and legislative experience. Um, that director is a full-time exempt employee and serves at the pleasure of the board. Um, there's also an advisory committee. Uh, you guys talked a lot about you wanted to have 
um, a lot of different expertise available to the board. And so you came up with a list of what's here is, I think, 11 specific folks who should be on there. So somebody with expertise in public health, somebody with expertise with ag, somebody in laboratory science, um, and that though they will be part of an advisory board, but that advisory board is not, the people on that, it's not exhaustive. The board under your language here has the authority to ask whoever they want to be on the advisory board. This is just kind of setting the floor, saying the, the advisory board has to at least have represent, you know, representation from these areas. Um, and then the, the board can <coughs> divide them up into subcommittees, maybe they have a public health one, maybe they have a plant science, et cetera, but then that would be up to the board to do. Anybody have any questions on regulatory authority? So for licenses, you recall you had six types of licenses. So cultivators, product manufacturers, wholesalers, testing labs, retailers, and then <coughs> integrated licensees. Um, so uh, a person can hold a maximum of one of each type of license, <coughs> with the exception of integrated licensees are a separate animal. Um, but so that would be if you had a new applicant who was coming in, they could have one of the five, one of each of the five, but they couldn't have multiple. So you couldn't have, um, uh, you know, three separate retail shops in different places in the state. You could only have one retail license. The integrated licensee is um, what you came up with to address uh, the existing dispensary. So an existing dispensary, right now there are five, if they wanted to apply for a permit, they could get essentially an integrated license. So right now the dispensaries are vertically integrated. So they're allowed to do everything from planting the seed to the sale, you know, to the customer over the counter. Um, but that option doesn't exist going forward in the commercial market with the exception of it would allow the dispensaries, if they chose, and they may choose not to do that, um, but if they chose to, that they would be able to have an integrated license and continue to be vertically integrated under this system. The board's required to establish tiers for the cultivators and the retail licenses and can develop tiers for other ones. You know, a lot of talk about specifically with regard to um, the cultivation licenses, wanting to look at making sure that there are options for small farmers, for people to who might be uh, growing uh, illegally now to be able to enter the market and trying to shift some of the illegal market into the regulated market. And so not wanting to make sure that there's not just kind of these larger uh, licenses. Um, so you'll see that the board's required to give priority to licensing small cultivators, and that's under 500 square feet and consider uh, policies that promote small cultivators. Uh, for applicants, you have to be 21 years of age and consent to release of all of your criminal history records and any administrative history records. Um, there was originally, as it came over from the Senate, a, a, a um, residency requirement, but you, this committee removed that at the, at the recommendation of the Commerce Committee based on dormant commerce clause issues. Uh, the boards are required to issue licenses as determined according to a system of priorities. And the priorities uh, require consideration of certain criteria that you can see there, um, whether or not the applicant is an existing medical dispensary in good standing, whether the applicants would foster social justice and equity in the cannabis industry by either being minority or women owned. Um, if they have plans to, to recruit, hire, and implement a development ladder for minorities, women, or individuals who have been historically disproportionately impacted uh, by cannabis prohibition, uh, looking at whether or not they're going to be paying a living, living wage and offering benefits, whether the proposal incorporates principles of environmental resiliency or sustainability, including energy efficiency and the geographic distribution of cannabis establishments based on population and market needs. This is one that comes up, I think, in other contexts, oftentimes people in d discussing the issue around towns and like if there's an opt-in and you have to opt-in and are you gonna see, um, uh, you know, like all of the retail places all clustered in certain areas or whatever, is the state's gonna be looking at and the board is gonna, when they're gonna be issuing licenses, is, 
is going to, you know, they'll know which towns have approved the retailers, but they're also going to be looking and saying, well, based on population needs, do we need 10 retail licensees in this town of 5,000 people? Maybe you do because maybe you're on the border and there's no other retailers within in Vermont within 50 or 70 miles, but they'll be factoring that in. Robin and Jim? Um, what's an administrative history record? Um, that would be like a regulatory record. So if you, let's say if you are an applicant and you, um, you know, uh, ran some kind of business that was licensed by the state, um, and so uh, so you had some kind. You guys probably know all of that much better than I do because you handle that with Betsy Ann. But if you were, if you had, if the, if the state had some type of administrative okay. record, right? Did you did you get your documents in on time? Were you cited for viola you know violations in your business? Things like that. So basically, were you OPR? Yes. Well, okay. Go yeah. Ahead. So basically, were you a good steward and basically yep. doing what what the state asked you to do and running your other business? Great. Thank you. Uh, so um, I just want to follow up on the question I posed to you um, yep. in the off session. Uh, one of my towns asked if they decided to opt in um, and allow retail. Mm -hmm. Can they control or the number of licensees in their town? Uh, in other words, they don't want 10 because mm -hmm. they're a ski area and it's right. very busy and a lot of traffic, um, but they, they want some. Mm -hmm. um, can they control, and I wasn't real clear from your answer and Tucker answers. There's language here that the board can set sort of geographical uh, parameters, mm -hmm. but the local, I'm talking about the local town. Well, I think there's, I, I, I'm unclear because I am unclear. Okay. <laughs> um, and that is because it's not specifically addressed in there. There's no language specifically in the local government provision that says it basically is you vote to allow retailers or they're automatically banned. So it's kind of like a, you open it up or you don't. It may, through the operation of whatever the locals have with regard to zoning or what they have and they're able to do, it may be that, you know, whatever, that it, it, it limits in that way at the local level, or it could be that basically as the state's looking and saying, well, because remember, you didn't limit the number of licenses and here it's up to the Canvas Control Board to basically look at supply and demand and figure out how many retailer licenses. Should we, should we just basically, anybody who applies and qualifies gets one or are we gonna say we're only gonna issue maybe in the first two years, only issue 20 retailer licenses statewide, you know, and therefore we're gonna make sure we really spread them out or, but there isn't, so the a, there isn't specific would, authority in this bill that says that if the town votes that they can say, yes, we're going to allow retailers, but we're only going to allow two. Right. Okay. But the board could. Yeah, the board could. Yep. Yeah, I'm reading the line, that the, the last bullet that's up there. Based on population and market needs is what they're going to make the decisions on. Does that pretty much lock out all small towns? I I would say not because when you think about like if you got a small town, you could be a small town, but maybe there's no other towns that are around you that I'll are doing example. that. Bottle Vermont sits on the border of New York and Massachusetts. Right. I'm going to say you're going to have a lot of market but, but, needs. But Bennington also sits on the other right. end, of it, which right. is a large population. Right. So if Bennington has a license, does that mean panel doesn't? Um, you know, again, it's it's going to be subjective and up to the board looking at that. And I think, um, you know, I would say people are going to be if if there is a need and there and you can make money there, people are, you know people are not going to apply for a license in places they don't think that they're going to be able to make money. And then the board's going to be looking at you know if, if you're a border town, where are you pulling from, right? So. If you're close to Massachusetts, you may not pull much because they can go to themselves. But if you're, you know, if you're near New York and their choices are to go to Vermont or I'll Mass. use an example. There's a liquor store in Bennington. There's a liquor store in Pano right on the line. And the reason <clears throat> is because people from the other states come to Pano and buy the liquor mm -hmm. and stuff. So that there is the, there's two really close there. If that applies the same to the cannabis, then it makes sense 
with what the wording that they're saying, but if it's strictly based on population, then there's Tom will never do it. You know, less than thirty four hundred people. Um, I I need to see your point. the point. Mm -hmm. It's okay for liquor, but I'm not sure if it's, I don't know if my town would even allow it, but. Yeah, I when I, I went to college in Northern Florida and uh, there were certain things you could buy in Georgia at the liquor store, like grain alcohol and things like that. And, and fireworks and your, Right, exactly. <laughs> and there was a liquor store right in the middle of nowhere on some old dirt country road. And that's where everybody went. <laughs> If a location is already selling medical cannabis, mm -hmm. can that business sell what I call the retail, you know, personal use, non-medical cannabis, whatever term you want to use, out of the same facility? Out of the same facility. I don't remember. I think maybe it's in there that yeah, they'd have to have an integrated license um, for one, um, unless they just went and decided not to do an integrated and they just wanted to get a retail license out of there. Um, I think that if they're co-located, then the board has to come up with um, rules around how they serve customers with regard to both. Um, but the thing is, is that if they if they were integrated, they wouldn't have to get approval from the town. If they just went for a retailer, they would have to get approval for for the town from the town. So. Sure. Any other questions so far? All right. So the local control, we started dipping into that. So just uh, so the, it's opt in <coughs> for retail, but not for any of the other licenses. Um, uh, municipality can uh, establish a cannabis control commission and that commission can issue and administer local control licenses similar to what we have for liquor licenses and they can condition the issuance of a license upon compliance with any zoning bylaw or ordinances regulating signs or public nu nuisances so basically using their inherent authority um, so it's not gaining any new authority um, and they can suspend or revoke a local control license for a violation of any condition on that license. And um, an applicant for a state <coughs> license has to obtain their local license prior to being able to operate with under, their, <coughs> under a state license. Under a state license, so you have to. If, you, if your local folks are requiring it in order to get your state one, you have to be in compliance with the local. Are there currently any regulations about dispensaries being within a certain distance of schools or daycares? There is in statute. Uh, I think there is a thousand foot for dispensaries for a school. Is that federal or state? State. I would say if you do wind up doing something like that, having some a little bit better clarity on that, because I know that uh, I think it just says a thousand feet, and then the question is, is it as you drive it? Is it as the crow flies? How does that work? And then if the school owns thirty acres, right? Yeah, yeah, it gets complicated. Right? Yeah. It, it gets complicated, and I can say mm -hmm. that um, <clears throat> not based on working on this, but years ago. Um, uh, on two different issues, the legislature has considered kind of those little radius prohibitions, um, both on, uh, they were looking at having, and they already have enhanced penalties for sale of drugs on school grounds or on uh, property abutting a school, but the <coughs> legislature was looking at doing like a thousand foot radius. And then there also was one about like, uh, essentially uh, banning sex offenders from living within a certain area <coughs> of the school. And um, I remember those debates, you wound up basically making it so that some of your more urban municipalities in Vermont meant you didn't, you had these big dead zones um, in some of the more uh, urban areas in Vermont. 
because of where the schools were located and things like that. So it, you have to think about whether or not, you know, you could, might be able to get it in there, but it, you know, and maybe that's what you want is that it gets pushed out to the, you know, uh, out, outskirts, but you may in some places <coughs> actually effectively prohibit it in some towns. Advertising, I'll spend a lot of time on this one. Um, so we have uh, all advertising has to be approved by the board prior to uh, publication. Um, can't contain any statement that's deceptive, false, or misleading, promotes overconsumption, um, represents that it has curative effects, um, can't offer free samples, um, can't offer prizes or awards, can't depict under 21s uh, enjoying cannabis or cannabis products, and can't be designed to be or have the effect of being particularly appealing to folks who are under 21 years of age. Um, in order to advertise through a particular medium, um, they have to be able to uh, show the board that uh, no more than 15% of the audience is reasonably expected to be under 21 years of age. So that's kind of uh, looking at, I think what California has this, has the, is it at 30%? Um, and so you, I think you ended on 15%. Uh, there's certain warnings that have to be on all advertisements. And then down at the bottom there you see what is considered to be an advertisement. So in consumer protection, this is where I just kind of did as a catch-all for a lot of the different stuff that I think is, um, they're small details but often very important to people who are, who are interested in the policy here. So um, all cannabis and cannabis products have to be tested for potency and for quality control in accordance with rules adopted by the board. Um, a licensee that's subject to testing has to have its cannabis and its cannabis products tested by an independent lab. So if you are someone who owns, who has multiple licenses, you can't say, well, I'm gonna be a product manufacturer and then I'm gonna send my products that I'm developing to my testing lab. You have to use a different testing lab. Um, all cannabis and cannabis products have to use a standardized symbol that the board's gonna adopt and that would be on um, all of, on any product that is containing cannabis. Um, cannabis products have to be packaged in opaque child-resistant packaging. Um, and uh, all cannabis and cannabis products sold by a retailer or an integrated licensee has to be in opaque child resistant packaging at the point of sale to the customer. Uh, cannabis products have to be lab labeled with the date the product was manufactured, the date the product's best used by, the ingredients contained in the product, as well as information on the length of time it typically takes for products to take effect appropriate warnings on the potential risk of consuming cannabis and the need to keep it away from people under 21 years of age, that cannabis should not be used by women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, and that use of cannabis can cause dependence in some individuals. John. Um, so I was just looking at the bill and looking at the, the rulemaking around testing for cannabis product, mm -hmm. products, and it says cannabis products. Mm -hmm. So would that include, include like with vaping, Mm -hmm. the, the actual cartridge. Yep. Yep. Okay. So that yep. and we might and I can find the language, but uh, you brought that up when we were discussing that, and yeah. we, I think I tweaked the language a little bit to make it clear that that, that would, and I think okay, it might be in the definition of okay. products yeah. or something right. like that. So yeah, I think given what we have heard in recent months about vaping <clears throat> injuries, we just want to make sure yep. that testing of Yep. Cannabis products includes testing the vaping apparatus. Right. Um, I'll take a look and, and see whether or not, like, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, I mean, I don't know how you how you'll do, how you'll do it procedurally, but. Um, 
because there's a lot of dates in this bill, no matter what, somebody mm -hmm. along the way is going to have to change all of that. So I don't know what your plan would be once you hear from like natural <coughs> resources and other committees, you know, you guys, if you guys wind up doing a substitute amendment for your amendment that'll be on the floor or however it goes but you know little things like this if you want to tweak I can start keeping a little list you know like a little clarifying yeah. bit things like that because I'll have to change all the dates anyway um, you know and you could do the dates in a, in a ways and means or an approach but it's probably cleaner if you have all of the policy kind of in your GovOps one along with the dates and things like that and then mm -hmm. if they stick to the money stuff and there then it's a little easier I think for folks to follow um, uh, so packaged cannabis can only contain uh, uh, no more than 100 milligrams of THC unless it's a topical preparation or it's a non-consumable product. Um, there's certain uh, products that are banned, so cannabis flower with greater than 30% THC, solid concentrates with greater than 60% THC, oil products, except those that are sold prepackaged for use with vapes, cannabis products that contain uh, t Delta 9 THC and nicotine or alcoholic beverages. So the combination, so you can't have uh, tobacco and THC together. You can't have, I guess, a lot of these companies developing these drinks, but you can't have a beer with THC in it. So uh, retailers and integrated licensees have to display safety information. Um, and then on or before November 15th, so we would say for next year, the board has to submit recommendations as to whether cannabis and cannabis products should have a minimum amount of CBD to aid in the prevention of cannabis-induced psychosis that occurs in some users. So the environmental provisions, um, these are actually, um, uh, you have a report back from the board on a whole host of issues and things that, uh, again, Natural is gonna be talking about. Um, so the ED of the board after consultation uh, with a and uh, and agriculture uh, is required to recommend things addressing this list here, so state and local land use requirements, um, whether certain establishments should be regulated by Secretary of Al Agriculture as farming. So we know that <coughs> hemp is considered an agricultural product and is regulated by the Agency of Agriculture. We've got the same plant basically over here being regulated by a different agency for different purposes. Um, uh, you know, should there be some kind of chewing up or um, working together on that. Uh, the water quality requirements for cannabis establishments, the solid waste and hazardous waste handling requirements for establishments, and any additional permitting or licensing recommendations. So that's on the environmental and land use. Then at the same time, they have to report back after talking with the commissioner of, of, the, of public service and the chair of the Public Utility Commission on recommended building energy standards for cannabis establishments if they're different from existing commercial building standards, recommended energy audit, audits for establishments, uh, including frequency of audits and who should perform those audits, and energy efficiency and conservation measures applicable to cannabis establishments. And again, Natural's gonna be talking about those later this week. <coughs> Um, in making the recommendations, the director uh, sort of recommend the permits, licenses, or standards that a licensed cannabis cultivator or product manufacturer shall demonstrate as a condition of licensure. Um, so right now, like the dispensaries, uh, so cannabis is not considered farming, and so it's outside of that. So they're getting different types of, of permits, but there's not, the, the medical law is really kind of silent about that, so they're just kind of plugging into the other areas of law and, to, you know, asking the state, what kind of permits do you want us to obtain for that? So um, this is an attempt to really be super clear up front about whether you're going to fit in, 
you know, as farming, or are you not going to fit in as farming, and then what types of permits and licenses are you going to need from other agencies? So, Michelle, just to clarify, I mean, mm -hmm. assuming this bill took effect today, and I mean, people started obtaining licenses, I, I mean, the, any, any business is going to be subject to our current land use yeah. requirements, Act 250, yeah. all the A&R <coughs> permitting. So, I mean, there's no exemptions nope. anywhere in this bill to any of that. Nope. Okay. Yeah. So, if this became effective today and you had residential zoning, could you, if you got a permit from the state to grow? Campus in that residential area for commercial purposes. Could you do that? Would it right be in compliance with the local zoning ordinance? That'd be, does the right to farm trump local zoning? Well, right now, this bill does not designate cannabis as an agricultural product or as <coughs> or growing cannabis as as uh, farming for purposes okay. of Act 250. So we it would have to definitively. Yes. Make it agriculture. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so what, if I understand what this is doing, is it's asking for a recommendation. Exactly. Back. Yeah. So subsequently next year, mm -hmm. the legislature could right. say one way or the other. Right. Right now it's not, okay. it will be subject to everything. Got it. All right. um, the issue, the question is, is because you have a cannabis plan and when it's hemp, mm -hmm. right now it's being treated as farming. It's being, you know, if you're growing the same plant, but you're <coughs> now growing it for different purposes, you know, should it still be considered farming, or should it be, have diff different requirements? Thank you. Okay. If it is declared farming, there is a statute that protects farming in, in the zoning. So. Yeah, it would exempt you out of a lot. Yeah, you can't make a local bylaw to. Right. I only asked because I run into that with him. Yeah. That clearly zone residential, um, but <coughs> because they got a license to grow hemp, that trumped right, trumped the local zoning. So consequently, some neighbors are not happy. Um, so, but that's all. <laughs> so, so my, I guess the question. I'll put it a different way. Should this be somehow stated that clearly it's not an agricultural product? Well, I think it's what it's doing. I know we're it's, asking it's, somebody. It's, it's, yes, we're de delaying that question. Yes, this is a, this is a, 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 um, a not even a, a, a sly attempt to just kick the can down the road. Um, this is the same. This, um, this is this is you know because because um, you know getting the it standing up and getting licenses is, is a little ways down the road. Um, this is saying, well, let's come back and look at that after we've started to really grapple with it. You know, one issue that O'Grady and I were talking about this morning, um, and I think we hadn't really thought a whole. Well, I just thought about the timing is that, you know, if this passed this year and then you stand up the board in the fall and the board initiates rulemaking, um, you know, quickly as it's required to, and then comes back to the legislature next January with its recommendations, it should be farming, it should not be farming, um, there are going to be in the process of rulemaking for all the other stuff and the licenses without having that addressed and so just from a time just to just to say you know the timing issue I think but I think it'll again it'll be probably discussed in the other committee and so you may get a recommendation around that for them right. and just to remind folks what some of the thinking was around um, kicking this can down the road uh, we we know that there are farm establishments out there who um, who are struggling and who might look for a, another cash crop to 
enable them to continue to support their dairy operation <clears throat> or to you know save a little money for retirement etc um, those are challenges that our farms are seeing right now so uh, we, we didn't I didn't want to make a, some sort of definitive blanket declaration about whether growing a cannabis plant is agriculture or not agriculture because there may be something in the tiered licensing idea that says for very small scale growers that you know that maybe it is appropriate for them to have the ability to do that on their existing agricultural land um, and so leaving that to the board to to really kind of take a deeper look at the landscape and ask for input from all of the folks on their advisory committee about land use and and you know soil and water and energy and all of that um, that's not necessarily something that I feel like we have uh, expertise in, um, but we're building a board that would have the ability to uh, to have expertise on those issues. I just want to clarify, I, didn't, I don't use the term kicking the can down the road as a disparaging remark at all, so it's a, it's a very, very valid, frequently used legislative strategy in terms of when you need more information and certain experts and things like that, you say, well, we've got all the information we need on this, but we need this, but let's keep the train we know moving. That. Okay. <laughs> As opposed to where we're writing this thing through. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> Um, so, uh, highway safety. So, um, first, uh, the amendment makes a ride training a part of all basic law enforcement um, training. So, there's like three levels. I can't remember what the first level is, like when officers are getting trained. So, the kind of basic roadside. Then there's like a ride, which is the middle. Then there's the DRE training. The a ride training is offered now, but um, it's not required for everybody. And so that would require that all officers be ARIDE trained by the end of, this would be now going to 21. Um, make saliva is added to the definition of an evidentiary test. Um, so evidentiary saliva tests are added to the implied consent statute in the same manner as blood tests. So when you have your driver's license and you're driving, you're considered to have given consent um, for saliva if uh, law enforcement has a reason to believe that you're operating under the influence. Um, they have to obtain a warrant just like they would for a blood draw to do the, to do the saliva. So um, uh, uh, it also codifies the presumptive admissibility of field sobriety tests and uh, DRE evaluation results. It adds EMTs and paramedics to the list of professionals authorized to take a blood sample um, and specifies that you can't take blood blood samples on the roadside. Um, amendment requires a person to make arrangements for his or own independent chemical, <coughs> chemical analysis. So if they take, if you have, uh, if there is a warrant, blood is taken or saliva is taken and then it's tested, if you want to have it independently tested, that's your responsibility, it's not the state's. Um, DPS is required to report to the standing committees by January of next year regarding a plan to establish geographic equity in the distribution of DREs throughout the state. Um, and then if the NHTSA approves a roadside chemical testing device and establishes a threshold level of THC um, to demonstrate impairment, then <coughs> Department of Public Safety has to issue a report that sets out a plan for using those devices in Vermont. Warren. I'm, I'm really wondering about that and the things and relying on the drug recognition experts who are human and have human frailties and, and I worry about the level of competence among that entire group of people. Have you heard or has Vermont in general heard anything about the continuing search for a, an effective roadside test of impairment? I, uh, I, I know what's happening. You can imagine there's a, a lot of states that are looking for that, and there's probably a lot of companies out there looking at a lot of money to be made by development of that technology. So I, I don't know what the latest is. You, you can certainly talk to law enforcement about that, but I know, uh, you know it doesn't exist yet, but a lot of people are working on it. 
other questions? Um, so money provisions. So you have your seven uh, positions created. So you have your five board and your ED and, uh, and an administrative assistant. Um, uh, board is required to provide recommendations to the General Assembly regarding resources necessary for information of the imp implementation of the act for the two years following. So um, they would be coming back and saying, okay, this is what our build out, this is what we're recommending our build out looks like, you know, in terms of once we have all these people licensed, we're now we're gonna have to do spot checks, we're gonna have to do enforcement, we're gonna partner with this agency, these are the resources we need, these are the positions we need. Um, they have to consider utilization of current expertise within state government and whether you could utilize other, other agencies or other positions. Um, there's a 810,000 appropriation, um, and that is to cover the salaries and benefits, operating costs for space, IT supplies, and I think a little bit of money built in there for um, that we think that could be used for the advisory, campaign per diems for the advisory committee, and also you know maybe a little money for a consultant, but probably not much. Um, and then let's see. And then the, they're to be working on the build out for, as I mentioned, for the, for the second and third fiscal years. Um, the appropriation is made in anticipation of receipts. So what you have is you establish the cannabis regulation fund in this bill. The fund is to be the repository of all the fees that are collected. So the application fees, the license fees, the approval, you know, the review of the advertising fees, all of those types of fees goes into this cannabis regulation fund. But because you won't have any fees going in there until after the board is up and running and the rules are adopted, you gotta, you gotta just run at a deficit within that fund. And then what happens is then the fees start coming in, filling in the fund. And then at the end of, I think, FY22, you see down here at the bottom, um, uh, if there's still a deficit within that regulation fund, then tax monies that are used from the sale of cannabis and cannabis products will go and fill that hole. It won't continue to go in there, but it's basically gonna fill the hole if basically you run at a de deficit for a couple of years after trying to stand it up. Um, the fees are not set in here. You remember that the, it asks the board to come back and make recommendations on all the different types of fees because there's a lot of different fees that in, contained and then there's probably going to be different tiers within each different types of licensing and the board would be just you know saying well if you're a cultivator under 500 square feet we're going to do this kind of a thing if you're a cultivator and you got you know 50,000 square feet then you're going to have this kind of a fee so they're going to come back and give you recommendations for those um, there's a 16% retail tax on all cannabis and cannabis products that are sold by retailers and integrated licensees. So there's not something going in between at an early, there's not like a wholesale tax or anything like that earlier. 30% um, of the tax revenue is dedicated to the substance misuse prevention fund. So that was a new fund that was created in here. Um, that's gonna be administered by uh, the commissioner of health. <coughs> Um, and so that's capped at six million dollars a year. So if you imagine, let's say that, um, I don't know the timing works, but let's say that you've had some retail sales in uh, July of 22. Um, if you have a hole still in your cannabis regulation fund, because you didn't collect enough fees based on your, what it cost you to run things up until that point, the first tax money would go to fill the hole in the regulation fund. And then then and then you would go to 30% of that tax revenue would then be going to the substance misuse fund. And then the rest of that money that would be generated would be going to general fund. So put the deficit down, mm -hmm. and then you split the rest? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, a municipality can collect a 2% local option um, if they have either a retailer or an integrated licensee in their town. Um, and uh, that goes uh, to the, the municipality, collects it, sends it to the department, and then it goes back to the municipality. There is 
Mm -hmm. can, can I just ask a question? Mm -hmm. I believe breaking news starts coming in uh, in FY twenty one, right? Mm -hmm. Is there is there any reason we couldn't start doing deficit reduction in your order? To just start, the, I know there probably wouldn't be enough revenue to completely reduce the deficit, mm -hmm. but I have to look at the timeline. Okay. Sure. I think that was the intention. Um, I have to sit there and look. I was get, trying to think when no, calendar know. year and then fiscal year and then how does it all do? So I'd have to look at and kind of maybe do a little timeline. But I don't think there's any reason for that. Okay. I'm just thinking about that. Um, and then finally, uh, <coughs> a couple of years out, auditor of accounts is required to report back to General Assembly whether or not the organizational structure, basically that you guys have set up. Um, is the most efficient means for carrying out the statutory duties of the board going <coughs> forward. So you're kind of starting out with this structure, but you know, once it's kind of up and running and going, does it still make sense to have this board, mm -hmm. or should it be kind of restructured to be more of like a typical agency <coughs> or something like that? Any questions for Michelle on this section? Oh, well, not on this section, but in general. Okay, I have some okay, other follow-ups. So Questions. Okay, Jim. Maybe this is more of a question for you. Um, the bill is in Ways and Means now. Mm -hmm. Did I take it from Michelle's comments earlier that they will just deal with the monetary aspects, or are they likely to make policy changes that we will either have to um, endorse or um, object to? Um, and same with appropriations. Have you got maybe you I have heard of that? I have asked that that policy changes be um, be brought back to this committee so that okay. because as you can imagine, if you you know if you start pulling sure. on one end of things, it impacts uh, other aspects of the bill. And, um, and so they might have some suggestions. Back <coughs> they might. Okay. Um, I think it would be helpful for us to talk for a few minutes um, about a meeting that we had yesterday, and I'll, I'll let John um, talk a little bit about about our our meeting. It, in general, we um, we are making a recommendation on these issues to the money committees, and of course, they have the final say. Um, the challenge with the money committees is that. Um, Ways and Means always likes to know how much money are they needing to raise in order to set the tax rate. And of course, Appropriations wants to know how much money they have to work with. And so it's a bit of a chicken and an egg. And so um, we have begun the conversation of trying to help the Ways and Means Appropriations Committees um, get a sense of what what is the b the best thinking about how to move forward with what should the the monetary needs be based on the size of the board and the recommendations that we've made and what should the tax rate be in order to um, to cover what we've put in for priorities which is filling in the uh, the cost to stand up uh, this new industry and then having uh, revenue to put towards uh, prevention. So, um, John, if you want to talk a little bit about some of the sure. meeting that we had. So, Kitty asked us before the meeting to contemplate what a small, medium, and Cadillac version of this would be. And both Sarah and I agree that the way to focus on that is the size of the board um, for the most part. Um, so, what we looked at was going down for a small, having a three member board. Um, which is what was in the original Senate version of the bill that came to us, um, that would reduce those costs um, to many. A medium size would be what's currently in the bill, which would be a five-member board with the prevention money not being spread out a little, whereas a Cadillac version would have more <coughs> prevention money front-loaded. Um, and I think, you know, appropriations will decide, I think, somewhere between a small and medium size um, process. The other thing that, that we looked at was the advisory committee um, and the size of it. It's currently a lever minimum of 11 members. Um, Kitty would be more comfortable if we cap that at 11. Um, 
uh, limited the number of meetings they could have per year and also um, put in the bill that the per diem and expenses would come from the cannabis regulation fund. And right now that does not spell out where those where the that expense would be coming from. Any questions on that? Huh? I have a question about <coughs> the, the the process for the prioritization for licensure. Mm -hmm. So the board uh, has a focus on social justice and equity. Mm -hmm. And if my understanding is that was considered in order to repair harm to people of color who have been disproportionately mm -hmm. prosecuted and convicted. Mm -hmm. So if if I'm a minority owned business and I have something on my record, how's that gonna be considered or for how am well, I the board harmless? is required to adopt rules to effectuate the priorities that you're setting forth in the in in this bill. And so they would come up with, you know, maybe maybe there's a point system or maybe there's certain questions they ask or maybe there's certain types of programs that, that people would apply under um, with regard to that. States do it in different ways. It's really kind of um, an emerging, you know, it's a newer idea with the, with the states that have just recently adopted mm -hmm. um, uh, recreational markets. And so, um, so I think that they would look at, so it would be the board kind of de determining how they would go about um, recognizing those as priorities. And could they consider expungement uh, of those? I mean, could the board expunge? Uh, or, I don't know, introduce that as a process? Uh, there's nothing in here about that, about mm -hmm. expungement. I mean, I will say that the legislature has been working pretty hard the last few years on providing mechanisms. There are some in existing law now, and there's another bill this year on looking at uh, you know, ways that people can expunge things on their criminal record and specifically with regard there are our uh, processes for being able to do that for cannabis uh, convictions okay. and, and I think OPR already has a process whenever you criminal records of a potential licensee um, they can make you know subjective decisions mm -hmm. about the appropriateness of, of providing a license mm -hmm. or rejecting that applicant for a license okay so I, I believe that model already exists. Um, you know, if you're concerned that we don't haven't done enough, maybe it's good. To, it would be good to talk to OPR. Mm -hmm. I'm actually already mm -hmm. talking to them about a similar issue. Mm -hmm. And there are other states that, when they look at people's records now, like they since um, states have done, you know, they might assign like a point system mm -hmm. to certain types of crimes. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you right. know, maybe kind yeah. of non-person to person, non-violent right, right, crimes right. maybe fit this category, right? Then things like this, they say, you know, you get higher points and then, mm -hmm. you know, financial crimes like uh, embezzlement mm -hmm. and things like that get these other, you know, kind of stuff and then it's a point, uh, but states do it in different ways and so okay. we're just going to the board to develop the how <coughs> the criminal history record. Okay. And all that stuff obviously comes back before yeah. LCAR, so you guys get another crack at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there will be, um, there, there very likely will be recommended changes to the, the bill from our money committees. Um, one other area of conversation that I wanted to make you aware of, um, we, uh, we had contemplated having the auditor come back with a report to the legislature after four years to recommend whether this is the structure that is uh, most necessary for the ongoing um, regulation of this industry. Um, there's, there is another way to, uh, to trigger <laughs> the legislature to revisit the conversation of um, whether a five-person board is going to be necessary once we have this um, industry up and, uh, and running, and that would be to sunset the, the Cannabis Control Board after a certain number of years. And so I just want to flag that as one of the possible um, preferences of our money committees um, that may may come back to us to, to think about. Any other questions for Michelle? Yes. Has there been any action at the federal level to reclassify campus? Um, not that I know of. 
it, the only significant piece of legislation is the SAFE Act, which goes right. more to banking. On the banking issue. Okay. Super. Well, if you don't have any other questions, um, I hope you feel fully immersed and are having flashbacks to <laughs> long days with this bill last April. Um, but uh, would welcome you to uh, to reach out to me or John or um, or Michelle directly if you hear from colleagues who have questions or if you hear from constituents who have questions um, it's this bill is going to become much more real now that uh, we have an expected timeline for the floor to, for the bill to come to the floor of the house and so um, I expect that people's uh, questions and, and focus on this will become more intent as we move forward. So thank you for helping us to revisit S54. Sure. Right. Thanks for having me in. Thank you. Thank you. So committee, before we shift you, I would also wanted to let you know that on Thursday at 11 a.m. there's going to be a press conference. Um, uh, I will be at the press conference uh, speaking alongside uh, Dick Sears to talk about what we expect the process and timeline is going forward um, and uh, we will be welcoming any members who wish to stand with us at that press conference uh, although you'll notice that we do have um, some work on our agenda on Thursday morning but we may uh, we may just work in a, a break to um, to push pause on our um, work on public records for a few minutes to allow members of this committee if they would like to participate in the press conference Thursday at 11. Uh, just, uh, just ask me to come in and update them what's going on. On house. Thursday at 11? <laughs> well, I don't know. They said for, for to Peggy to schedule me. Yeah. So, okay. uh, but. Well, Senator Sears and I will be at a press conference, but I don't expect it to last very long. So, no. so committee, um, it, is, uh, it is important for us to take a moment here at the beginning of the session to review. Uh, the Government Accountability Committee work and um, the ways that we can measure the performance of our uh, government uh, agencies and departments. And so I've asked Betsy Ann and Drew to visit us again and it is my hope and intention that we um, can collectively um, come back to this more frequently than we have in the past. Um, and use this as uh, as a, the lens through which we uh, look at how state government is working for our constituents. So, thank you, Betsy Ann. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. It's mm -hmm. nice to see you back here. Uh, for the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. I handle government operations, and that includes staffing the Government Accountability Committee, which is made up uh, of four House members and four senators and uh, the chief performance officer in the agency administration serves as a non-voting liaison and we have a GAC member right here in this committee rep jp is on, on the GAC and uh starting this past session when he began serving as a legislator so as its name suggests the government accountability committee focuses on how government can be more accountable to Vermonters. So what does that mean in practice? The way I think about it is proving to Vermont that the laws that you enact are actually benefiting Vermonters. They're doing what you wanted them to do um, and you can prove that they're doing what you wanted them to do and that they're having a benefit. Um, so GAC got started in 2008 and GAC is focused on different mechanisms of, of how to make government more accountable to Vermonters. It started in 2008 in what is called the Challenges for Change Act. And for those of you who've been around for a while, um, Challenges for Change is essentially a term of which we will not speak any longer because <laughs> it is over and done with now. But the one thing that was um, Still happening in challenges for change was um, not only the creation of the GAC, but this report on data that measures the state pro state's progress in reaching certain goals. And so, when I first started in the legislature, 
the challenges for change, that was really what was all that was left of that act was the creation of the GAC and this report on measurements. But then that was finally repealed and in its place, um, GAC in the legislature enacted in the law your 10 outcomes for the state and then the indicators to measure the progress to reach, um, to measure the progress in reaching those outcomes. And now GAC has moved into different methods to have a focus on government accountability. And I will review that with you in a moment. But big picture, GAC has a statute in Title II. It has a, its overall purpose, and I'm reading from this draft GAC report. Um, the GAC has reviewed this report. You'll see highlighting through this report. Those were just the few tweaks that the GAC had requested um, to this report. And GAC is meeting later on this week to approve a final version of it. Um, but this is the substance of what the GAC members have approved so far. Um, but GAC specifically in its statute is supposed to recommend mechanisms for state government to be more forward thinking, strategic, and responsive to the long term needs of Vermonters. And there's nine specific tasks in their statute that they have to pursue that goal. Um, they're generally about how to an analyze the effectiveness of government. And then they have some specific requirements that are applicable here to what they're recommending for this year. Um, it's recommending enhancements to the legislative process to support greater long-range planning and responsiveness to Vermonters' needs, and then recommending strategies for all three branches of government to prioritize the investment of federal, state, and local resources and programs that respond to those needs. So we've got only a finite amount of money how are you going to make your decisions on how to spend that money and how are you going to use your limited legislative time to determine what sort of bills you want to enact in law. And that's really what GAC is trying to focus on now, um, how to make the legislative branch focus more on really looking at the resources you have and figuring out how to wisely spend those resources. So the report talks about the outcomes and indicators um, as a reminder, your outcomes are set forth in this statute. Here they are. There are 10 goals for the state, like our Vermonters are healthy, um, our elders live with dignity and in settings they prefer, and we have an open, effective, and inclusive government. You've got the indicators. This is on your webpage. Um, this, this is the data that gets reported annually that measures our progress in reaching those outcomes. And then the chief <coughs> performance officer puts together an annual state outcomes report that shows those, uh, the indicator data for each of those outcomes. And we looked at that at the beginning of last year. So you're familiar with the outcomes and indicators. Um, the administration also um, has its own form of using data to measure progress when it puts out its annual performance measure budget report where it has uh, performance measures for many <coughs> programs in the executive branch that kind of measures how well each of the programs are performing. So we've discussed those issues before. What GAC is really focusing on again is what else can be done to make government more accountable? And they're suggesting in this report that you can have more accountability embedded into the legislative process. And to help legislators frame how they can do this, the GAC held a workshop in early November there were about 80 legislators, I believe, that attended. Um, and the focus, it was led by Drew Rusley, who is our Performance Improvement Director in the Agency of Human Services, and the Chief Performance Officer, who's Sue Zeller, um, in the Agency of Administration, plus Rep Kornheiser, um, who has a background in performance accountability, I think, with nonprofits. So they led this discussion for the legislative workshop. And um, I believe Rep Kornheiser might even come back to your committee to talk further about this. So today I'll just give more of a high level overview of what was discussed at the workshop. Um, and GAP will be holding more workshops um, for legislators to attend to um, try to have more of a focus on what you're doing and how the legislative process can actually be proven to show that it's helping create the change that you want to see. 
So the one, one of the ways that the GAC recommends that this can be done is when you start thinking about what you want to propose in a bill. Um, because when legislators, as the report indicates, when legislators introduce bills, um, you're trying to address an issue, right? That's why you introduce legislation. You see a need for um, some sort of change being necessary, and so you introduce a bill on the topic. What GAC is recommending in their report is for legislators to think more critically about whether the idea for a bill is really the most effective way to address the issue that the legislator perceives. And the GAC is recommending that this critical thinking include using <coughs> data, but also fact finding to understand the root causes of an issue, an understanding of what drives the root causes, and how the impact of a bill um, that's intended to improve the issue could later be evaluated after it's enacted in the law in order to determine whether that law is actually addressing the issue like it was originally intended as the legislature enacted it. Um, and GAC states in their report that it's important for legislators to think really critically about whether to introduce a bill and the language it contains because in addition to the actual impact it's gonna have on Vermonters once, in, once it's enacted, all stages of a bill use valuable, limited state resources of time, money, and energy. That's what it takes to do anything, right? Time, money, and energy. So that includes the legislative staff time to draft and ed edit it and to analyze its fiscal impacts and to schedule <coughs> testimony on it and to understand and explain the consequences of it. It takes your time, your valuable limited time, to review and understand and debate a bill there's the major consuming time of the executive and judicial branches to execute and interpret the law after it's, after it's enacted, and then the overall fiscal cost to the state of actually supporting it. All of that goes into a bill as it moves through the process. So GAC in its report is encouraging legislators to be fully informed about the impacts their bill idea would have, and whether their bill idea is the correct solution to address the issues that the legislator perceives. And so GAC is recommending some just common sense questions that legislators should consider when evaluating their idea for a bill. And they put together at this workshop this handy dandy uh, handout that's at the end of the GAC report. Uh, it's called the Legislative Intent Guide. And these, you'll see, are pretty simple questions. Um, but the point of these questions the GAC says is to help a legislator be more informed about what they're trying, the issue they're trying to solve and how to go about solving it. So these questions are pretty simple. It's what's the primary issue that you're hoping to resolve in your bill? What are the long-term goals or desired goals that would be met if this issue were resolved? What data and info helps illustrate the forces around the issue and unpack the root causes of the issue? What's the specific change you want to propose in your bill? How does your proposed change address those driving forces or root causes of the issue? What's your specific desired result <coughs> of the changes you propose in the bill? <coughs> and how are you going to know what happens as a result of the bill? If the bill is enacted in the law, how will you know that it's doing what you wanted it to do? Um, really goes, part of it is going to the data that's available. Um, you've got the state outcomes report. That provides that indicator data on each of the outcomes. So that's some data you can use um, to see you know, if, for example, we were just talking in Seneca Ops about the smoking age bill. You know, you saw an issue, the legislature saw an issue in smoking, and so you look at the data to determine that the legislature, it seems, saw an issue with smoking and that's why you enacted the higher smoking age bill, for example. Um, if you're looking to solve an issue on the program level, you could look at the administration's programmatic performance measure budget to look at how programs are performing. Are they still necessary? Do they need to be more robust or are they not necessary? But in addition to data, it's also just talking with people about the issues that they're experiencing um, to better understand them 
yourselves as legislators, the GAC says in this report. Um, GAC advises that when you have this greater understanding of the issues that you're trying to address, um, your legislation will be better. You'll be able to tell Ledge Council, for example, exactly what you want to do and the language that you want to see to um, address the issue you're perceiving. Um, and also, it's going to help legislators prepare to back up their bill when they come into committee to introduce it to a committee to justify why they introduced it in the first place and why the bill is needed. And then, once it gets to you, GAC has some questions that it believes that committees could use when looking at bills in your review in order to understand whether the bill proposes the correct policy and um, whether there should be any tweaks to the language in the bill in order to actually get at the issue. Because a committee's role includes understanding and analyzing <coughs> policy in order to make recommendations on it. So GAC says in its report that not only should individual legislators be introducing well-informed bills, but committees also should use their own tools to evaluate whether a bill proposes an effective means of addressing an issue within a committee's jurisdiction, because your time is valuable. Um, GAC says in its report that committees can use their limited time more effectively by scheduling the most appropriate witnesses who represent a range of viewpoints because you don't want to just hear from people with one viewpoint. You don't want to have a one-sided um, understanding of an issue. Um, you need to understand what you don't know and what info you need to find out in order to evaluate a bill. And then you need to understand how to use that information to make a final recommendation on a bill. And so GAC is recommending that committees can ask some simple questions, prepare for a hearing in advance of a hearing, um, and, and in order to orient yourselves to the issue in a bill, um, such as these questions. Like, what, what are the, a basic question is, what witnesses do we need to hear from? Who's got the subject matter expertise? Who has individual experiences that speak to what's being proposed in the bill? And who has the data um, that can help the committee understand where you are right now? Um, on the issue that's being addressed in the bill. And then how will you understand what committees do you, um, who do you, sorry, what witnesses do you need to hear from to not only understand the bill's language and policy implications, but also any unintended consequences if you do what's proposed in a bill. Also, what's the rationale of the people that are advocating for and against it? Where are they coming from? What info do you need to understand the bill and how are you going to use it? They have a handout for this as well. It's called the Data and Inquiry Committee Guide. Um, and so we reviewed the info on the witnesses and figuring out the information that you need to evaluate the bill. But then they also have some neat questions down at the bottom, I think, um, for individual committee members to really, um, as you're listening to testimony, um, if you're not fully understanding all of the information, some questions to ask of the witnesses that are before you, um, such as, I'm new to this issue. Can you explain the problem or issues that have led to the discussion that we're having today? Um, what do you hope changes as a result of the bill? Um, what do you think are the general assumptions about the issue versus what the data is telling us? So there's just some questions that the committee's members can ask that the GAC is suggesting that you use during your committee process. And GAC finally in its last part of the bill, it, er, of its report, is recommending that you um, attend more some of their trainings that they're going to be offering. Um, so they had their workshop. It was kind of an intro to how to um, keep charging ahead on performance accountability. Um, and they will be having some more accountability trainings. They, I believe they're going to be meeting this Thursday um, when they review this final report and talk more about the performance accountability trainings. And they're going to plan them. And I'm sure you'll be getting more info on them in the future. So that was big picture of the report. I don't know if Drew would like to add anything. 
um, at this point, but Drew has definitely been an asset to the committee along with our chief performance officer in helping legislators kind of think outside the box. Um, there was one thing in the report that I forgot to mention that um, I think that needs emphasized. And one of the things about accountability that the GAC is also suggesting that um, the legislature do is not only be in the business of enacting law, but then also looking back at the law and figuring out if it was actually doing what you wanted it to do in the first place. Um, and this is mentioned toward the end of their report. So it's easy to just understand that there's an issue, well maybe not easy, but your main role here, what you mostly do here, is enact laws and to address issues. But then the question is, is the bill that's enacted in the law, is that law actually doing what you intended? So one of the things that GAC suggests is you can't have sunsets in laws um, that kind of forces you to go back and look at an issue. You do this in multiple occasions. Um, a couple I can think of is, for example, the Search and Rescue Training Committee. Um, that committee has a sunset. You have extended it once so far because you saw the continuing um, value of having that Search and Rescue Training Committee. Um, there's also, for example, a temporary um, funding source for the Ethics Commission is another example. So you will need to um, consider whether you will extend the funding for the Ethics Commission. You will take a look. If you, if you do nothing, that funding source will run out. Um, so those are ways to kind of force the legislature to um, look again at an issue, to determine whether the, the laws you enact are actually doing what you wanted them to do. Um, another way to do it is to just call witnesses back in after you've enacted a law to talk about, is it actually doing what we wanted it to do? Whether it is the executive branch that's executing it or the people that are actually affected directly by it. Um, and another method, a third method, is to actually require in enacted legislation um, a report back on data. Because having that report back on data, um, many times in verbal form, if it's not necessary in written form, um, you can just have the executive branch, for example, come back with the data um, that explains how the bill enacted in the law is actually performing. So those are some methods that I thought I would mention because it's, I think, Senate GovOps was just talking about the same issue um, before I came up, um, that many times it's enacting laws and then um, it's not such a common practice to then follow back up on how the laws are performing. I'll end it there. Any questions for me? So, say you have a, an issue that is common to five different legislators and they're each coming at it with their own bill. So how might this process connect them? So you have one bill maybe that might be stronger than the five individual approaches. I can at least address one part, at least from the legislative um, drafting perspective. Um, so any legislative, uh, a, a legislator request for a bill draft by law is confidential unless the legislator requesting it uh, allows us to share the request with other interested legislators. So if, and we try in legislative council, it's for our benefit too, yeah, right. we try to be good about asking legislators if there are other similarly interested um, legislators, would you like me to share with them that you have requested this bill? I try to be good about it, but then again, sometimes I get drafting requests in the back room, so it's not always easy for me to remember to ask yeah. that question. Yeah. Um, it's helpful for us, us, because if there's many interested legislators and they're all trying to do the same thing, then that's going to be a collection of people in just one bill. Mm -hmm. um, but there's different reasons why that it's not always possible mm -hmm. to have co-sponsors and maybe there are five individ individual bills on the same subject. I think at least one possibility is for the committee to see, oh, I've got these ten, five bills on the same topic. Um, perhaps mm -hmm. one way for you to work in committee is to ask the legislators to come in and talk about the common interests 
and where they could find some headway or maybe the legislators themselves would say oh we all have similar bills where where, where can we all get together and agree on the same issues mm -hmm. drew would you add, add anything to that i would just add from the um listening into the government accountability committee conversations this did come up several times um and in addition to what Betsy Ann offered, there was discussion around um, imagining using the legislative intent guide as a way to actually mm -hmm. help facilitate that conversation between multiple legislators. And of course, I know that all of this requires coordination and time, which is not always available to a citizen legislator. <coughs> However, in advance of submitting a bill request to legislative council, you could also imagine um, thinking of a different mechanism by which you can sort of get the word out uh, to fellow legislators that you were considering um, asking for a bill to be drafted and would anyone else like to do that, have that conversation up front. So we imagined the legislative intent guide as we were working with it at the workshop um, to be useful at a bunch of, at several different points in time um, during the legislative process. So certainly upon drafting or considering an idea that may be useful um, to have drafted in a bill, um, at the point that you may bring a bill, introduce a bill to a committee to have the sponsor or at least the committee as a whole be able to move through it with the legislative intent guide, make sure there's a clear understanding of what the bill is trying to do. Um, and then also, if trying to consider combining several bills to be able to ensure that there is clarity and consistency through the language, all, you know, all strategies laid out in the bill or all the means pointing to the same ends. But it's a, I love thinking about that question because it's, I think that that would um, clarify some of what the legislature is intending to work out between different bills that may be different but similar. Thank you. They've done a good job. <laughs> okay. They explained it very well. The big thing was the history of it. And I wasn't even aware of some of that. Yeah. Did you do as good of a job as you might have if you were called upon? <laughs> they, uh, and unfortunately, I was not able to attend that training due to a family emergency. But anyway, um, they are going to ask more training. And I've heard nothing but good about that training session that they had. And they're going to have a, a repeat. I believe it's going to be pretty much the same thing, right? And I would highly encourage everybody who didn't go to the last one to try to make this one. It might be good for some of these prolific bill generators to maybe attend it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 People in the area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not naming anybody. Mm -hmm. no, I'm not. <laughs> Are you pointing at me? I'm not. I mean, no. if the balloon lands over that way. <laughs> 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 So thank you, Betsy thank Ann. You. I would love to invite Drew to join us and the chair. And um, as I said when we kicked off here at the beginning, we are looking for ways that we can make better use of this as the Government Operations Committee. Um, and uh, you know, happy that. We do have a member of our committee who's uh, who's serving on GAC and uh, and also would look to you for some um, recommendations. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Drew Wrestley. Um, I am the Performance Improvement Director at the Agency of Human Services, and I'm lucky to sit at the Government Accountability Committee meetings with um, Sue Zeller, the Chief Performance Officer, who is a non-voting member. Um, I don't have a prepared testimony today, um, and I'd like to sort of consider myself as just a support and elaboration to Betsy Ann, as well as the committee and the chairs, um, Senator Colmore and Representative Townsend, um, thank you, and uh, Representative Kornheiser, who I hear is coming back. So you can consider anything I say in the context of what they um, present to you. But we did discuss several strategies um, at the workshop that's been mentioned. And uh, one of those was the legislative intent guide, which I kind of elaborated in response to Representative Coulson's question. Um, but I think you'll see that we're, the Government Accountability Committee is making an effort to expand the use of the language 
um, that is available to legislators beyond just one or another framework. We spent a lot of time in Vermont um, using results-based accountability, but that is not the only methodology that exists for asking common sense questions to move from what we're trying to accomplish through to how we might do it. And so we wanted to sort of broaden the questions to make sure that it was accessible to everyone. So this legislative intent guide can be used at several different points throughout the legislative process. It's a one page document, very simple, something you could print out and have in front of you um, or keep in your back pocket as you think about legislation that you may want to introduce. Um, I won't go through it all again in detail as Betsy Ann just did and I know you all have a copy, um, but it was intended to be quite versatile. Um, and I think as a collaborative tool, working together to move through a bill, especially in committee, it could be an excellent way of making sure that um, that no one is getting lost in the weeds. I understand how dense testimonies can be at times, and I also know, partially because I've written one or another myself, how dense reports can be that come from the executive branch. Um, and as you're thinking about how to draft legislation, how to change legislation, or potentially how to consolidate legislation, um, and certainly communicate about it on the floor or to one another, this can be a useful, a useful tool for guiding the conversation. Um, right, so an as a second step, um, and Representative um, Brumstead, who sits on the Government Accountability Committee, has been passionate about this piece of the work, um, is sort of an elaboration <laughs> of that legislative intent guide that focuses a little bit more on the data and information that you might look to specifically to help um, articulate the measurable issue that the legislation is attempting to resolve um, or the measurable intent. So how might you be able to understand if we are making progress using data over time? Um, so this piece of the legislative intent guide asks for um, one to three specific measures of programmatic performance or statewide conditions that might help you to understand um, those questions. Um, you can apply, a, this is intended to be not too um, bureaucratic, however I'm seeing some of my own tendencies toward bureaucracy in here. Um, you can apply your own basic criteria to understand the extent to which the data you ask for will actually be useful to you. That's obviously the primary criteria. Will you have an interest in looking at the data that you've asked for and will you be able to understand it? And if the answer to those questions are no, then it might be worth thinking what other type of information or, or format of information is gonna be useful for answering your questions. But first things first, can the data you're interested in actually be collected? Sometimes the answer to that question is no. And if my colleague, um, Chief Performance Officer Sue Zeller was here, she would tell you about some of her frustrations um, with some of our inability to collect certain pieces of data that you might expect we could. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are involved in technology conversations that happen around here, but there's a direct connection to what the technology we purchase enables or doesn't enable. So that's always an important question to keep in mind there. Is the data updated frequently enough to be useful? So if you pass a piece of legislation and are really interested in what the outcomes are um, of that change in the next year, the data may not be sensitive enough yet to actually help you understand that. So having a, um, having a sense of how frequently the data is collected and when you might have a real read on the impact of the change made through the legislation is an important thing to keep in mind. Can I communicate about the data clearly so my colleagues can understand? I mean, this is something we think about in the executive branch all the time. If the data is too technical, it's not gonna be useful for um, using it to understand uh, current state or, or the impact of certain changes. Um, and finally, would the information help us understand something centrally important to legislative intent? So um, data is great, but not if it's irrelevant <laughs> to the conversation you're trying to have. So just making sure that the data is actually useful is really what this is getting at. Um, these questions in some ways elaborate not about the data, but how you will use the data. Um, so we know that the legislature has several mechanisms in place to, um, to internalize information and do something with it. Um, and so in some ways, this is just about thinking how you will integrate use of data in those existing um, mechanisms, for instance, committee hearings or joint committee hearings or public hearings um, or 
reports that the executive branch will submit. And I also know that some legislators are in the practice of actually visiting with uh, one or another organizations or systems that have actually um, done work to implement legislation. And certainly that type of activity will give you a really good read, much more so than a graph or a chart will about how things are going. I'll probably kick myself for saying that later, but you know what I mean. Um, and so I have a note to myself down here that this is an adapted performance note. You may remember from last session, we talked about the performance note, and this is basically that idea. Is there a way for us to just keep tabs on the information that we think will be helpful to us moving forward? Any questions about that? It's pretty straightforward. It's really just a matter of getting used to using it and seeing if it's something that really works for you. The Government Accountability Committee has a theory that it will be helpful. Uh, but it's up to you to really test that theory. And then um, we had some fun at the workshop in a mock committee hearing, <laughs> which was Representative Kornheiser's idea, um, playing out essentially what could happen in a committee hearing if there wasn't clarity around what you were listening for and why you were having the testimony. And as Betsy Ann emphasized, your time is limited and, val and valuable. And so how you want to use it, um, especially in this room and in this format, uh, is something to think about. So this data and inquiry committee guide is essentially organized to think about how can you as a whole committee plan for the testimony that you want to hear based on the different legislative intent that you're working through with different bills. Um, how can you consider ways of preparing witnesses as well as preparing yourselves for what you want to listen for um, and what questions you might want to ask to dig deeper. Um, again, you, I could imagine a committee um, having a conversation that touches on these questions in advance, like at the very beginning of the day, in advance of several testimonies, or, or for just a minute or so in advance of one testimony, to sort of focus everyone. I think a lot of committees already do this, and I definitely heard at the workshop that there are some committee members that are interested in seeing more of that type of structure take place. And then individual committee member thinking. So I know that this is a little bit simplistic, but I have found it very helpful to use this kind of a mechanism for myself in my own work, reminding myself of simple questions I can ask that will keep me focused on what I'm really trying to understand. And it's certainly useful with a whole group of people to have this type of thing in front of you. If you can't follow a conversation that's happening, but you know you may have to vote on a bill at a certain point in time, it may be useful to reference one or another of these questions to pull yourself back in. So very simple. The Government Accountability Committee is interested in making sure that not only is the executive branch um, focusing on how to improve mechanisms for accountability, but also that there is partnership between the executive branch and the legislative branch um, in thinking through how to use data and testimony, not just testimony, but inquiry to, to make responsible policy. I would recommend, um, just as a result of the legislators that attended the workshop and their enthusiasm for it, keeping a couple of copies of the legislative intent guide around, around the committee room or practicing just having it next to you while you go through a day and see if you find it, if you find it useful. And I'm sure Representative Kornheiser will talk a little bit more about how she sees that playing out. I'd like to get away from legislative intent for just a second and uh, talk about how GAC is used in the state government. Um, since you're from the Agency of Human Services, can you give me an example of how your agency has used GAC to improve its performance or service to the people of Vermont? The Government Accountability Committee? Yes. Um, or the GAC principle. Sure, yes. So the Agency of Human Services has, over several decades, um, been working to advance use of an accountability system or practices in an accountability system that are oriented to outcomes. How do we know if the work we're doing is improving the lives of Vermonters? And how do we know that the work we're providing is quality work? And so over the year, I've been at the agency for about six years, and um, I was just saying this morning that I encounter everyone I encounter, and new employees is always the most exciting, who already know about results-based accountability because of the work that we have done to sort of make that language accessible and the tools accessible, and want to understand how to ensure that they, in their roles as 
grant managers, for instance, um, are implementing those tools uh, appropriately. So there's a cultural component that I think is, is significant to name. Um, but also there has been a proliferation of use of data across the organization. So um, on the Agency of Human Services website, you can find performance dashboards similar to, similar to the one that Betsy Ann showed for each department um, and also across department. Essentially data stories about how well our programs and services are doing by Vermonters and by standards of quality. Um, so I think that's another example, just seeing more data about program performance out in the world. And then we've also recommitted ourselves to publishing community profiles, which were um, first started under um, Secretary Con Hogan's tenure at the Agency of Human Services and that we've sort of revived in the last two years, which are population indicator data. So about all Vermonters, not about one program. Um, that are available by county, hospital service area, and um, Agency of Human Services district. So those are also available on our website as a means of trying to facilitate and enable um, community organizations, honestly across sector, but certainly outside of just one organization to do strategic problem solving, uh, turning the curve, as you will, for outcomes for Vermonters. Um, so as a result of this data, has your agency ever uh, decided to ship funds from one program that isn't doing as well to a program that is, or perhaps even discontinue a program that has found to not be effective? That's a great question. I mean, I think it gets right to the heart of it's great to have data, but what are the mechanisms in place to use it? Um, Certainly, and I think you'll see, um, hopefully you will see, in the testimonies from our uh, leadership of the Agency of Human Services that there is always data that comes associated with decisions around the budget. Um, I can't give you any specific examples off the top of my head about programs that may have been cut or reshaped um, by data that's on a dashboard or you know, draw that thread specifically for you. But I do know that all the conversations that we're having that are significant around reform reforming programs or consolidating contracts or grants are all data informed. Thank you. Yeah. But I mean, I will say, and I know I presented to this committee about this in the last session, that that's one of my biggest areas of interest is how do we ensure not only that the information is there for you to grab when you want it, but that it is, um, that it's sort of baked into every process that we are engaged in at a governance level. Yes, thank you. Questions committee. Are there other states that have taken on this process? And if so, what have been their legislative outcomes in terms of impact? Right. Um, that is a great question for um, Representative Brumstead. Mm -hmm. I know off the top of my head that Utah, and I want to say Connecticut, Mm -hmm. um, both implemented the use of performance notes, so similar to that um, second part of the legislative intent guide around different types of data mm -hmm. that traveled around with each bill through the state house, um, along with I think what we would consider like a fiscal note here. Mm -hmm. um, and they, Utah may have even implemented some more um, sort of stringent requirements around introducing legislation related to performance uh, measurement. Mm -hmm but I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. And I know that the state of Connecticut um, has done a lot of work um, to support legislative committees to use dashboards, like the one Betsy Ann showed, for specific areas of interest. So Connecticut has a dashboard that I think is called something like Protecting Connecticut's Children, or something like that, um, where they've got about five indicators that are specific to child welfare that the committee would look at every single year mm -hmm. as a way to start the session. Thank you. So let's chew on this committee. We'll, uh, we'll have some time with uh, Emily Kornheiser probably next week sometime um, to hopefully help us um, figure out ways that we can use this going forward. Um, and I do appreciate the, the worksheets that, that have been developed and I think I would like to
see if we can get some copies of those uh, made. I don't typically do paper copies of things, but um, uh, but in that case, it's helpful to have them front and center when you when you're contemplating something. And I wonder how many birthday parties you're going to need to go to to see the impact of your balloon bill. <laughs> <laughs> or how many won't be held. That's great data out there. Oh my God. That is, that's all of it. That gives me yes. jurisdiction. There you go. It's about the children. It's, it's, about, it's, it's for, for the children, children. yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much, for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Okay, so in uh, in keeping with our efforts to take a, a broad saunter through many different um, areas of jurisdiction of our committee, um, we need to take a look at vital records. Um, and so Tucker has prepared a, a presentation for us. And in the Within the vital records uh, policy area, there's there are a couple of components of a housekeeping bill that the Department of Health has um, has asked us to work on, and so um, I'm not sure if David wants to speak specifically to the cleanup bill or if you want to just talk generally with us at this point about vital records. I would recommend not getting too deep into the the cleanup bill at this point because we are not <coughs> going to take that up in earnest until um, until we have S54 headed to the floor. Um, so whatever you tell us, we may not remember in three weeks when we come back to this. Um, but I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm happy to speak with whatever altitude the committee does. Thank you. I appreciate that. We have flexibility. Good deal. Or go as low as we need to go? Is that that altitude is from zero to... <laughs> Moon. We'd like to see you brush the treetops, actually. No, just kidding. How much hair is in that? Um, so, uh, Tucker. Or how many? So, Tucker, I have, a, I have a request for you um, yes. before we get started on your testimony. Yeah. It's, I, we're here in day one, and I know that there are many things that we need to, to kind of get back into legislative form and shape, but I'm noticing that the iPad that is at the end of the table um, likes to go to sleep. Okay. And I'm wondering if you could change the settings so that it doesn't go to sleep. <laughs> well, well job. Should you say the operator's going to sleep over here? Yeah. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, clearly, it is the first day of session because we have all forgotten that I am the least iPad capable person in the room at any given moment, including right now. But uh, perhaps I could take some Harrison's lessons from the guru. Um, are, are you going to um, give your testimony off of the, the iPad or off of your laptop? I will use my laptop okay. because of some uh, debacles from last session, <laughs> mostly coming from the gentleman to my right. I decided that I would pair everything on my laptop this year when I could so that I didn't have to. Um, didn't have to come on in to Yeah. Didn't have to have my iPad skills compared to Betsy Ann. You just throw it at the wall, right? That's what I heard many times, and I could not find the wall. Didn't know how to throw. It was all lost on me. How many iPad supporters this committee is you, you need a, what do you want? He's, he's going to connect and work off of this, so you can put the iPad away. But thank uh, you, Jim, for your speedy response to did you do it? Yeah, it's, done. it's now 15 minutes. So if the presenter doesn't touch the screen for 15 at minutes. some point in 15 minutes, it's going to snooze. That's perfect. And if they so don't if touch it during that period, it deserves to shut down. Yeah. Because we're all asleep. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good afternoon. Uh, Today we'll do a little walk through uh, the vital records history of Vermont. It'll cover uh, over 200 years. We'll do it probably in less than 15 minutes because most of the changes have come within the last three years out of those 200 plus. Um, and along the way we'll get to have lots of historical fun, 
will talk about uh, amending session law that has not become effective yet. And uh, thankfully, Dave is here so that I won't have to wade through the morass of administrative rules. But we will highlight the changes that have come in the last year uh, with regard to the identification required to get copies of birth and death certificates. Um, before we begin, on your committee information page, Andrea has posted a volume of documents that I sent along. It covers everything that has happened since 2016, mm -hmm. uh, acts of the legislature, um, rules from the department, some guidance from the department that has been uh, posted on their website that I found particularly informative on this subject, uh, and the document that I put together here, some bullet points as a primer. You're not going through all these, are you? I'm going to read every word on every page. <laughs> um, it would be yeah. helpful if you could do an appropriate pause in between each word as well. Yes. <laughs> uh, so just to cover some general background about the history of uh, vital records in Vermont. Um, for the most part, vital records were recorded at the local level by town clerks. This was the case uh, since the founding of Vermont, since it entered its statehood and stopped being a republic. Um, and it continues to this day with what are known as uh, issuing agents under the current vital records system. Um, in 1856, we had the first vital records law, statewide vital records law, we'll say. And that established a state registry of births, deaths, and marriages. Uh, the Secretary of State was charged with the duty to bind and index annual lists that were delivered by the town clerks uh, to the state system. And just for fun, I went into our 1862 volume of statutes because I knew that you would want to take a look at this. And um, it's a bit small. Um, and. Uh, one of the things that you'll note if you pull this up from the web page is that back in the day, yes, the town clerks played a vital role in recording vital records, but so did the school district clerks and clergymen, and they even went out of their way to say that yes, friends or Quakers can also uh, solemnize marriages and record certain documents. Um, and there are some interesting anachronistic, well not anachronistic, timely but antiquated uh, details in there such as information that had to be recorded uh, your husband's job when you got married or your father's job when you were born uh, in 1902 the State Board of Health was charged with the duty to collect the annual list prepare statistical tables regarding vital events and deliver the list to the Secretary of State for preservation. 78 years later, we have the next significant step, which was the Department of Health was charged with the responsibilities previously assigned to the Secretary of State. And that was the point that some of you here in the committee were at, and the General Assembly was at, in 2016, where you had multiple local agents, local officials, and multiple state entities that were all involved in the state's uh, vital records system. 2016, the General Assembly established the Vital Records Study Committee to look into the state system and propose reforms to how vital records are recorded, preserved, and issued. Uh, the study committee was composed of members representing the Department of Health, the state archivist, the probate division, and municipal clerks. And again, those are all of the parties that were involved in these various vital uh, events records. At the end of their study, the committee recommended eliminating this patchwork system of vital records collection and preservation, consolidating the duty to collect this information under a single point of administration, establishing a single civil registration system, authorizing whoever was the single point of administration to delegate certain vital event recording authority to local officials in keeping with Vermont's history and of course practice that is um, practicable, and to determine by rule the duties of those officials. 
to limit the individuals to whom a vital record may be issued, which was a huge point for the study committee at that time, and uh, to have modest increases in the fees for the issuance of certified vital records. That led to Act 46 in 2017, um, and this is the substantive change that has led to uh, the rules from the department. Um, Act 46 established uniform definitions for Vermont's vital record system, including what constitutes a vital event certificate and a vital record. It established the statewide registration system and charged the state registrar of vital records with the duty to operate that system. Uh, the system was also designated as the sole repository of data from birth and death certificates on or after January 1st, 1909. It charged the state registrar with the duty to register all birth and death certificates. Of course, this was previously with the town clerks. Uh, it provided that only issuing agents, which are either authorized representatives of the state registrar, town clerks, are authorized to issue certified and non-certified copies of birth and death certificates. It limited the inspection of vital records and the issuance of birth and death certificates so that only certain persons are eligible to receive certified copies. Um, it required all requests for certified copies of birth and, birth and death certificates to be made upon application um, and submission of a form of identification established by rule. Further, it directed the state registrar to administer a vital records alert system to track fraud or illegal activities. It transferred certain duties from the probate division to the state registrar for the amendment of birth and death certificates, <coughs> the issuance of new birth certificates, and the issuance of delayed birth certificates. Um, within this act, we also had some delegation to the state registrar to adopt rules. Um, first, the act required the state registrar to prescribe the content and form of applications for birth and death certificates, and that includes the number of acceptable characters on a birth certificate. I know that's a detail you're very concerned about. Uh, manner in which vital records shall be submitted to the registrar. Physical requirements and security standards for the storage of vital event certificates. And this piece uh, was more important than I appreciated until I heard some testimony last year in Senate GovOps about just how valuable and expensive the certified paper that these certificates are printed on is. And when I heard that, I thought that maybe they should be delivered exclusively in armored vehicles. Um, the manner in which the Department of Public Safety shall furnish lists of missing and kidnapped children, and the procedures for governing, governing the public inspection of birth and death certificates. Further, the Act expressly directed the State Registrar to adopt rules governing the acceptable content of a birth certificate, the acceptable forms of identification required in connection with applications for certified copies of birth and death certificates. Finally, the process for denying a certified copy of a birth or death certificate based on the alert system. That brought us into 2018 in the special session. And those of you who were here remember that right as the session was ending and it was edging towards the effective date of that 2018 Act, uh, H16, which eventually became Act number 11, uh, vital records were added in to delay the implementation of this system by a year. And that brings us to 2019. Uh, in 2018, uh, the department issued final rules covering all of these mandated criteria that we just went over. Uh, I did provide that initial 2018 final rule uh, as one of the documents that was posted to the website. Um, this past July, the department uh, adopted an emergency rule, Dave? Yes. yes, an emergency rule to address some issues around the forms of identification that would be accepted for 
uh, individuals recently released from a correctional facility. And then most recently, a final rule uh, addressed that. And individuals who are in the continuum of homelessness care. Um, the reason being, there was this cycle where if you did not have a vital record, such as a birth certificate, you couldn't necessarily get other forms of identification. But if you didn't have those forms of identification, you couldn't get the vital record you needed to demonstrate your identity. So for individuals recently released from a correctional facility and some homeless individuals, this was quite the conundrum and the rules addressed that. And uh, I can pull up, let's see which one of these it is. Here we go. I believe this is the last one, Dave. You can yell at me if it's not. Uh, it's not the final one because I would say adopted. Adopted, okay. This is just the one that was next to the copier, so I yeah. snatched it. Um, you can well, have my copier, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that is the state of the state with regard to vital records. Um, I have nothing further from our end to add. Uh, when the rules came into LCAR, as Representative Gardner knows, Legislative Council's role is to, uh, if it's within one of our subject areas, to advise LCAR if for some reason the rule uh, appears to be outside of the delegated authority. Uh, I don't believe that that was an issue here. Good afternoon, my name is David Englander. I'm the Senior Policy and Legal Advisor to the Commissioner of Health. I'm delighted to be before you. So Madam Chair, where would you like me? What, what altitude, what would be most helpful to the committee? 28,500 feet? <laughs> okay. Um, I think the biggest, from 28,500, I think probably the, the, the most important thing to know was one of the many drivers of, of Act 46 was that Vermont was one of three states to be a so-called open record state. Um, we just Tucker described that anybody could get a certified copy of a birth or death certificate, um, which lent itself to significant possibilities for fraud. Um, there was no way for the Department of Health to, for instance, deny if, if some person from, pick your uh, kleptocracy in a failed state, you know, asked for 15 copies of my birth certificate, they could get it, and there was no way for us, unless it was actually a dish of fraud, there was no way for us to actually deny that. Um, Excuse me, David, yes, do you please. want any of these 50 documents on the screen? <laughs> can we have all 50? Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I can do them side by side. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, I, think, I, I think if we want to talk about, I mean, I think if, I think maybe we, we want to talk about the rule more, whatever the, the committee desires. I don't okay. have anything I'll, particular. I'll be on standby. Let's, so, uh, let's talk about the rule. How is the rollout going is the other question, because I'm hearing concerns from folks who, from colleagues who yeah. heard from their town clerks about, right. um, about how the rollout is going. Sure. So um, I'm going to go a little bit below 28.5 then. So, so we are now, so, so, so one of the things that, it, that, that, um, if you're not intimately familiar with, with, with this, the, the, the biggest change um, on an operational level was that birth certificates, for instance, used to go, paper copies would go from the hospital to the town and to the Department of Health. Death certificates would go from the funeral director to the town and to the Department of Health. And what this established was a statewide digital system whereby all information is, add, is added via computer. Um, so the hospital understands the information, 
it is there, it is then available at the Department of Health level instantly, it's available at the town, at the town clerk level instantly, and they can be, and, and certified or non-certified copies can be printed out at both, at any of those locations, any, any, any clerk uh, that has opt in, they may opt out if they choose, uh, but any, any issuing agent. So the idea being that you have one, you have one central database and so you don't have many different, you don't have different copies of different certificates because we were an all paper system for a very long time for it since, since the 19th century, or since the, actually since the, probably since the 16th century. Um, so um, it's worth noting that um, this ended up being significantly more complicated than we, I think that anybody had imagined changing this, this massive system, um, which is why we did need a little bit more time to get the, 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 um, the computer system online um, and also to establish the rules. We have been in constant communication, I would say, with, with the clerks and clerk associations. Individual clerks email us questions, they call and they ask. I would say, to be, to be frank, that the, given the complexity and how many towns and clerks there are, I would say the rollout has gone extremely smoothly, which is not to say it's been perfect. There are mistakes within the system. Um, there are many that the, um, what we call the legacy records, which is uh, before 1908, there are many errors in the documents themselves, and there's also errors that occur between um, the having the document in front of them, which is handwritten, and the and the inputs into um, uh, into the system, that is actually largely done by Ancestry.com. And then when so the Department of Health folks are not sitting with documents and transferring them, we made a deal with Ancestry.com some years ago that they would give us that they would give Vermonters access to Ancestry.com, and they would and they would do that uploading. When we find errors, we correct the errors. When clerks contact us, we, we correct those errors. Um, but it's going to take it's going to take some time to make sure that, that all the records are, are true and accurate. Um, I think that what we what we endeavor to do is when when clerks and others contact us is to be is to be meaningfully responsive to their to their concerns and, and work to do better. The oh. so has all of the data been loaded onto the state system now? Are you current as far as everything that's supposed to be available in the database? My understand. I, I'm happy to check on that. My understanding, the answer is yes, but but the, with the caveat that it is not it is not perfect. That, that the legacy records are still we're still working through that. Um, there was one. In, there was a few. There were a few unintended consequences of the um, of Act 46. One one issue being that we'll we'll talk about in three weeks, so you can forget about this immediately. Is that uh, there were because anybody could get certified copies. It was easy, for instance, for um, agencies of the state to get certified copies within the within the course of their bona fide duties. So, if DIVA needed uh, needed copies or DCF needed copies for for you know for, for a minor, they didn't have they, they could just go and get it. But now they're restricted from doing so. So that's so now that has created complexity. So we'd like to unwind some of those complexities and return things to the status quo. Yeah. So I just want to understand legacy records. Yep. Those go. Like 1908 and earlier, yes. or is so, That's considered so legacy right. like if I were searching for uh, Representative LeClaire's birth certificate, it may not be there if it's part of the legacy record. No, it would not. So because it was hatched. Um, so it would be. So it would be there. It would be. It, it would be. So it would be both in the in, in the in the town okay. where the representative was born, and there would be a there would be a paper copy. Yep. And then it would be also be on the it would be on the system. It's just that the that the it because, might not be accurate. It's possible that it won't be accurate because of just because of human error. Okay. Thank you. This is the father. Unclean. <laughs> so describe to me the pace at which the health department is. Um, able to answer the concerns that you're hearing from different municipalities? Uh, it depends on the nature of the, of the concern. So I would say that we, we always aim to respond meaningfully within a matter, within a matter of days, and, but sometimes there's a limited amount of, of, um, of authority the department has. So for instance, if somebody says, I'm, I'm, finding, I'm finding a lot of errors, we would say, alert us to those errors and we'll, and we'll help you correct them. But there's nothing that we can do that's sort of systematic 
that's systematic because it's because it's all done by hand. And somebody has to be looking at the record to see that my middle name is Curtis and not Michael. You know I mean? there's, no, there's no way for a Department of Health person to be able to look and see that that's the case. You would have to have that knowledge. So with respect to legacy records, which I guess registered by an Ancestry.com, what would be the process for correcting a record if a clerk you know, says, OK, you know, my, name, my middle name is not Curtis, it's Michael. So you, you'd contact the Department of Health, and then they would make that correction. And they correct it. Yes. Okay. I mean, there was some kind of documentation would be required. You couldn't just call and say, actually. But the department can make those corrections in the system. And then you inform the clerk when the record's corrected? Yes. Because usually it's, it's a one-on-one -on -one call. Somebody's calling and saying, uh, this is a problem. And then we would say, we can, we, can, we can correct this or we can't correct this. And that, that's the way it should be going. Because of our agreement with Ancestry.com, uh, is it true that Vermonters receive some kind of special deal? Yes. That, 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 that Vermonters have access to, to Ancestry.com. It's not complete. What you, I actually, I once paid, and I actually got the full thing. So, we, But Vermonters get more than, than persons who, who, where states have not gotten that. They have more access to records. You talked about problems. I know uh, my sister-in-law came and saw me. I can't remember it was this summer and went. But she had a homeless person she had to find, and she needed just what you were talking about. She needed a vital record or something, and she just couldn't get them? Yes. Is, has that been solved yet? Yeah, so that's so in the rulemaking, as, as Tucker briefly described, um, that has been, so the, the, the two main issues that we, um, that we we address in the most recent rulemaking, and this is this I mean this was this was, this is effective as of January one, okay. and that and that allows the Department of Health to, because the law requires that we specify a by rule acceptable identification. And again, Tucker will describe that there's a catch there's a catch twenty two. Anyway, so um, if I went and told so, her that I'm it's sorry. okay. That this this has been corrected, she could go solve that problem. So today, I would say so. If a person is 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 on the is on the continuum of homelessness, but they have but they have access to some kind of um, of assistance, that there if there's a um, there are any kind of organization that, and it's actually let's see we can I can rather than guessing at the um, uh, a homeless service provider means a government or nonprofit agency receiving federal, state, or municipal funding to provide services to a homeless. To a homeless person, or that is otherwise sanctioned to provide these services by a local homeless continuum of care organization, that organization can certify by affidavit that that this that this is this person's name, and that is sufficient for the purpose of the Department of Health to issue a certificate, a, a, a certified birth certificate. And it started January first. January one. Okay. And the same thing is true now with people who are being who are leaving um, uh, DOC custody. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that any because um, as it turns out. Uh, Vermont DOC as well as, well as um, federal and other state um, uh, uh, penitentiaries have issued identification. No businesses apparently accept them. So that isn't of a lot of use. So we adopt a system whereby um, if, if, D, if um, the DOC makes a representation, they send us about a two-page um, document that says, this is David Engler, this is his name, this is where he was born. That, that's sufficient to, to issue that person a birth uh, or death certificate. And just to amplify a, a brief point that, that Tucker made, which is the which is the, the value of the paper. The paper costs the Department of Health or the State of Vermont about a dollar a piece, but it's but it sells for tens of thousands of dollars in the black market because you can create you can create a false record whereby you can get you can take somebody's identity or you can take their benefits. So that is all that um, so that's actually both that's also in the rule is the security necessary to safeguard that paper because there are places where people just have been leaving the paper, you know, in the printer. Um, we want to make sure that that is, that is not the case. But I remember when we took testimony on this, there was some system that each of these pieces of paper is numbered, right? Yes. And, and so they have to be using them in numerical order and but, recording that. Is yes. For our purposes, for the Department of Health and, and other issues, we have to issue them in order or we have to 
but somebody theoretically could still take, take it, we might note its loss, but there wouldn't be a way to necessarily tra to track that down if somebody just takes it to another state and is using it. There's no way to, where it, has, it has a serial number on it. But can you track from where it was lost? You could track from where it was lost, but if it's but if it's stolen, right? No, yeah, I guess. yeah, yeah, yeah. Better money than that in canvas. It's an ID. Become a citizen quick. <coughs> Any other questions? So, how, how do you track errors in records? How do we track errors? I don't know that we track errors. You mean like how, like how many errors? Yeah. I don't think that we do track errors. I think when we find errors, we correct them. I don't know that there's anybody out there saying we've had this many errors. I can certainly check. Are you finding patterns in terms of where these errors came from? No. I mean, other than, other than human error. Random human error or yes. inattention when looking at one set of records? Yes. Um, there are, I, I can't, it's a, it's a, there's a translation term about I've lost, but there's something that, that translators, the mistake they do, they, they'll, they'll skip a line. They'll be translating this line and they'll skip the next line. And there's, there's things like that. People, do they sometimes skip words? Um, so it's not, it's, uh, I'm making this judgment, but it looks always like harmless error. Somebody was trying and they failed for whatever reason. I'm, I'm going to go below 28,000 foot level here. And just so I'm, when we talk about the errors, so let's say that you know I got Mr. Harrison's birth certificate back in 1909. Um, somebody's actually key entering the data in off of that into the system as opposed to say scanning it. And yes, it can't be scanned because it's because it was it's written in cursive by hand by a person. Mm -hmm. 110 years ago. So why can't it be scanned? Because the I think I mean, because I think there, there there's this well technology. I, the techno I mean I'm ah, I'm okay. way beyond my but I would presume that there are right that there may be there is sophisticated you know scanner technology at, at this point but my understanding is that that's all been or it may be that they that I should say I don't know. It may be that there's a there's a top line where where it, it scans what it can and then it spits out um, so like, I, I, that could be happy. that's a great question. I'd be happy to check on it. And how much of let, let's so, so let's say that I'm a town clerk. It's the town's been around a while, so I get extensive records. Do I have the option of, of Ancestry.com doing most of that work for me, or can I do it myself into the system? You could you could make you could make corrections. <clears throat> But I don't think, but I don't think there's any town clerks that are, are hand in are, are hand inputting. Using Ancestry.com to do this seems to me to be a big benefit to the state, but perhaps an even bigger benefit to Ancestry.com. Are they putting this data? into their system of yes. ancestors and all that? And yes. The idea is that they're mutually paying beneficial. them or are they paying us? Um, uh, I have looked at the contract for a long time. I think that there, it, I think that there's no money changing hands. I think there's an M, I think it was an MOU. It was, it was before my time, mm -hmm. but I can, I can certainly look. I'm not. We, I, we were not, pay, we are not paying ancestry.com. No. I'm, I'm not opposed to them right. increasing their yes. ability to provide this kind of information on ancestry in general to, to the public. If they find a John Doe that was born here on a certain date and somebody else said he'd been looking for that John Doe for years and years and years, and here he is, he's been found. That's great. But quid pro quo. Yeah, yeah really. quid pro quo there. <laughs> in common parlance. <laughs> yeah, that's fast. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that is bad. Hey. Questions on this overview of my records. Okay, we will uh, we will have you and or Shayla back um, 
Sure. In a few weeks. Great. And, and I did make an offer, Madam Chair, and I would be happy to come back and I can do you more. I do a, because I do so many rules, I have a, a rule making run a 101 with plate spinning and, and uh, unicycles. And I'd be happy to provide that to the committee. Really well. well, watching that, actually. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Visually entranced as we listen to the <clears throat> description of how a rule is made. Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.